I want to start, of course, talking about Russia, Ukraine. We saw literally just hours before Davos starts this year, yet another war crime committed by the Russian government. Reaction to what we've seen in Dnipro and the way the war is proceeding right now? Yeah, well, I think the last time we talked, I was quite concerned about war fatigue uh, hitting in with inflation, food price, energy price, and people just getting sick and tired of the war. But it is clear that Putin has a knack of changing that just when it counts. And unfortunately, he does it in a tragic, brutal, uh, way by committing war crimes against civilians as he did this time around. And as long as he continues this, I think the support of the West and the rest of the world is going to be steadfast. Um, what about how, at what point, I mean, we could continue to see all sorts of military equipment that's being provided by the West that, frankly, even several months ago wouldn't have been countenance that say, no, it's too dangerous, it could lead to a greater escalation. What do you think is principally driving that at this point? Uh, I think it's the wish that Ukraine wins this war and by a victory I mean that we go back to the borders of uh, 2014, so before the annexation of So you mean Crimea. Crimea as well? Exactly. I, I think that's kind of the only solution that we're looking at at the moment. And in many ways, I, I wish Western leaders, of course, it's easier for me to say now as an academic, but Western leaders should use the Mario Draghi phase, phrase from the Euro crisis, whatever it takes, which basically means that you need to provide all equipment possible. Because at the end of the day, if Putin gets away with the nuclear threats or whatever he's doing, he's just going to continue to do more of the same. Now, I understand the argument that everything but Crimea, um, these are the territories taken since February 24th. Crimea, of course, um, historically, and I don't mean like historically in the Soviet Union, I mean when Ukraine was independent, was an autonomous region. It was governed locally. It had its own parliament that flew a tricolor that looked a lot like mm. Russia. Uh, majority Russians on the ground there. Um, does that in any way change your view and how it should be handled? Or do you think it actually needs to be taken militarily? No, I mean, the way in which I think about it is international rules and norms. And of course, if you look at Ukrainian independence from 1991, that was when the borders were agreed. Yes. And if you look at all UN charters, if you look at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Russia signed that charter in 1992. It's about territorial integrity, integrity. Yeah. and sovereignty. And Russia has violated that. So if we believe in international law and international norms, it also means that Crimea is Ukrainian. And so Crimea would be returned to Ukraine, but would still be fully autonomous and self-governing under that strategy? Most probably that is the system that would then prevail. So my question then is just how do you how does one affect that? I understand that one would want that as an outcome that one would negotiate for. You're suggesting no, actually Ukraine needs to physically take that. Now also keep in mind at the time that it was taken illegally, annexed illegally by Russia, um, there was a Russian base, there still is a Russian base in the port of Sevastopol, a very important one. Again, what does one do with those circumstances? To be very frank, I think the only solution that we have here is a military solution, which basically means that Ukraine needs to push as far as it possibly can. And then, of course, I think at the end of the day, it also means regime change in Russia. Uh, is this going to be easy? Is this going to be short term? Uh, the answer to both of those questions is no. Now, your position, um, which is supported by many in the Baltic states, many in Poland, frankly, not supported by many in otherwise on the continent and also not by the Biden administration. One of the major um, uh, changes that we've seen over the course of the last 10 months of war is that NATO has gotten a lot stronger. The EU has gotten stronger. We're seeing more coalition integrity. Um, how do you handle an issue like this that has such potential divisiveness within the coalition itself? Well, the first observation to make is that the Baltics were right and we were wrong. You know, they were warning about Russian aggression. I warned about it personally in 2008 when I had mediated peace in, in Georgia together with the foreign minister of France. Um, we were too silent after 2014. And now I think the issue is very binary. It's black and white. So we have to follow what the Poles are saying, what the Bolts are saying. Of course, we'll find some middle ground at the end of the day. But the truth is that I think the whole security balance of Europe has tilted eastbound and we have to listen to what the border countries uh, to Russia have to say and remember Finland has uh, 1,340 kilometers of that border with of, Russia. Of, ab absolutely the case um, but do you think that coalition politics have the potential should have the potential to move 
the ultimate negotiating position away from what you just said? I think they'll have to find a compromise eventually. Yeah. Of course, when it comes to you know, borders, it is difficult to compromise. But I think the person that we need to listen to this, and I know this is a little bit of a, you know, uh, escaping reality is we have to listen to what Zelensky and the Ukrainians want. If their message is borders 1991, then our message should be borders 1991 Let's as well. Talk about the Finnish border. Of course, you do have a very long and historically yeah. challenging border uh, yeah. with Russia and former Soviet Union. Um, given how poorly the Russians have performed on the ground in the war in Ukraine, does that make you in any way a little less concerned, at least near term, about Finland's uh, border security and national security? Security? Well, I think, you know, if you have a 1,340 kilometer border with Russia, you always have to be concerned because, as we can see, Russia is quite unpredictable. I mean, one of the reasons that we have one of the largest standing armies uh, in Europe with over 900,000 men in reserve and 280,000 that can be mobilized in wartime is not exactly because we want to defend ourselves against Sweden. Uh, it is because uh, there is a real Russian threat. So never underestimate the capacity of Russians to cause havoc. So in that sense, I think you always have to be wary. Now, Russia did used to have basically three things that they could threaten all of us with. One was energy. Well, that's almost that's gone. gone. One was the economy. That's, that's gone. almost gone. And one was military. And we're sort of looking at it. Well, you know, if you can't even take over Ukraine, why go anywhere else? Um, talk a little bit about Russia's position globally. Um, you know, irrespective of the fact that the war continues to grind on, they have, the Russians have lost an enormous amount in terms of geopolitical, geostrategic, and yeah. geoeconomic standing. As we think longer term, beyond the fighting on the ground in Ukraine, how do we approach that reality? Well, probably two answers. One is to say that there is always a way in which great powers rise and fall. And of course, we saw the Soviet Union during the Cold War as a superpower uh, and then falling, but trying sort of to claw back power. But now it has basically fallen into oblivion. I mean, in many ways, it's a rogue state. There are some countries that are calling it a terrorist state. The size of the Russian economy is uh, less than 2% of world GDP. So we're talking about the largest country in the world with the greatest natural resources, which basically hasn't been able to organize itself and now is isolating itself globally. Of course, it tries to have allies around, but I would argue that we are very much split. So then we come to point number two, and that is, what about the future? I think what we need to look at in terms of European security is a total split. 44 European countries on one side and Russia on the other. Do we begin co a conversation to bring them back now? No, no. we don't. Mm. So we're looking at 5, 10, 15, even 20 years of Russian isolation. And someone, you know, who is a neighbor to Russia and who has a lot of Russian friends. I find this a sad reality, but a reality nevertheless. So it's a generational end of the quote unquote peace Oh, dividend. definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And you know, I mean, I look at my grandparents who were fighting in the winter war, actually 105 days, a fairly similar situation that the Ukrainians are in right now. And then the war of continuation, we gave up 10% of our land. And, and you know, that sort of sentiment stayed there. It stayed there for decades. And I would argue that was probably bubbling somewhere under the surface. And now that Russia has attacked Ukraine, boom, it's up there again. So people are actually talking about Russia now in a way in which we haven't seen Finns talk about Russia for decades. And also talking about NATO in a way that the Finns have never oh, yeah. talked about yeah. NATO. Now, the Turks are yeah. continuing to slow the application mm. process. How much of that is just because of the upcoming Erdogan election? Does it go away afterwards? How much of this is actually a structural problem that might cause bigger challenges with the application? Well, I would, of course, hope that this is more of a domestic political situation, but, you know, I'm not involved in uh, Turkish politics. Fortunately, Finns and Swedes are fairly calm in these situations, so we're not taking very any aligned, major... Coordinated yeah, on, very yeah. aligned, and, you know, we don't take knee-jerk reactions, and if you look at the messages from our political leadership, I think it's quite clear that eventually uh, we expect to become full members of NATO, say sometime next summer. Uh, finally, talking about the WEF uh, right now, I mean, w w a little bit less focus on Ukraine, frankly, on the agenda and from the attendees than we saw 
uh, back in May when you and I were together. How much does that concern you, also relevance, and how much can come out of the forum on this issue? I think we're looking at a lot of spillover effects from the war in Ukraine. So we're talking about globalization. We're looking at trade. A lot of people are afraid of protectionism. We're discussing the IRA from the United States. Yeah. Uh, will there be retaliation? We're looking at Chinese presence here, which is quite limited. Only 60 in the delegation. We're looking at a rather prominent delegation from India so it's very much about I guess the theme of the of, of the whole Davos event you know cooperation in yeah. a fragmented world and I do think I mean you and I talk about this a lot I, I think we need to start thinking about what is happening in a end of post Cold War era and my argument is that I think the West needs to start becoming a little bit more humble and realize that they're not the main game in the show anymore Alex Stubb, always good to see you, my friend. Thanks a lot. Thanks.